6 to 10. Uh, so again, today we're going to be in Galatians 2, 6 through 10. Uh, last couple weeks you guys have wrapped up uh, Galatians chapter 1 and started on Galatians chapter 2. Um, before we jump in today, just want to kind of do a recap though. Uh, want to be able to ask you guys um, what's been going on in the book of Galatians to this point. What's, been, what's Paul been talking about? Why has he been talking about it? I know these answers. I'm just this is y'all's part. There's no other wrong answer. What do y'all got? I went to Jerusalem. Okay, that's right. I went up to Jerusalem. That's it. That's that's all. As far as we got, he wrote a letter. He wrote a letter. There you go. <laughs> we are cooking with bacon grease today, guys. Uh, so, so this letter that Paul writes, he remember we started off, and he starts off this letter to the to the Galatians, and Galatians is a region uh, or an area, it's a bunch of churches that are that are in this area or this region, okay? And he writes this letter because something's going on. He writes this letter, and he starts off, and he. He starts this letter off and he immediately jumps into something that's really bothering him. If you look at other letters that Paul writes, he usually has a greeting. has like, hey, you know, blessings, you know, whatever. We're going to say all this stuff, you know, you know, blah, blah, blah. We're happy to be able to, to know things are good with you or whatever. But in, in this letter, immediately he starts off and he addresses a problem. As soon as he gets done with just who he is, um, and even in his introduction in verses one, I think it's one through four, um, he ends up saying I think two times in there that this message that he has is is not from man, but it's from Christ Jesus. Um, and that's a central thing that even in what we all looked at last week and what you're going to look, what we're going to look at today is the central idea. The message that he has is from Christ Jesus. It's not something that he made up. Okay, um, and so like for, that's the first thing he says in his introduction, and then in Galatians one six. Um, he said, and then six and seven and eight, um, he talks about this idea that there's only one gospel message. Um, there's uh, uh, only one gospel message, and if you're not living what that gospel message is, then you're living a non-gospel life. Um, and a lot of people, guys, today, they think they're living a gospel-centered life, and they're really not living a gospel-centered life. And Paul, as he's talking, he says there is only one gospel. Period. Um, and any deviation from that one gospel is not really the gospel. And that's, that's what he's trying to make super clear, is that you can live the gospel or you cannot live the gospel. And you guys, as he's writing to these Galatians, he's saying that y'all are not living the gospel because y'all are taking another message and you're trying to marry it with the true gospel. And what's happened in Galatians is that there's a group of people called the Judaizers, okay, and that's Jewish Christians, uh, who would say who would say and acknowledge to some extent or another um, that Jesus is part of salvation for them part of salvation uh, the other part is following the Jewish law if you don't follow the Jewish law you cannot truly be saved will be their message in fact they say that's message in, in the book of Acts they say in order to be saved you must be circumcised and follow the law of Moses um, and so that's their message and so they Paul went and preached the gospel, and he said, there's only one way to have salvation, and that's through Christ Jesus alone. Christ sent his son so that we could have fullness of life through Christ alone. And people accepted that message, and they said, yes, truly, this, this is true. We'll accept this message. And then this, these Jews would come in and say, look, you know, Jesus is part of it, but you can't have salvation without taking up the law. And a big part of the law of Moses was circumcision. You had, as a man, you had to be circumcised, in order to really be a part of the, the covenant of Moses. Okay, so y'all y'all for tracking with me on that. And it's super important that you guys understand that and that you have that uh, down as he's talking because if you don't understand that concept and that's what's going on, as you get into chapter 2 and even what he's talking about right now, you're going to be like, oh, you know, I yeah, whatever he's saying, it's, it's all good, you know. But at the heart, that's what he's talking about. These other people have come in. And they started teaching a different type of gospel, which Paul says is not really another gospel. Okay, super important that we get that. Um, and tons of implications for us today in that, that too. I just can't harp on that enough of how there's only one gospel. And any time that you take and you add to the gospel, you're fooling yourself in what the gospel life looks like. Okay? I'm just, I'm just going to say this too, just because I like to reiterate. Uh, the idea of taking and applying something else to your life, guys, that's, that's saying that I know this movie's wrong for me to watch, but I'm going to watch it anyway. 
that's taking and applying what I want to do to the gospel. And we're fooling ourselves if we think we're living a Christ-centered, gospel-centered life when we take and we add the life that we want to live to the gospel. That's a false teaching that says you can live how you want, you can do what you want, and go to church on Sunday. You can live what you want and do what you want, and you can, you're still a great Christian and you're still living this gospel-centered life. That's a false, that's false doctrine. That's, it's, it's, you can't get any more false. Paul says there's only one gospel, and anything that you do in addition to the gospel is, in, is the non-gospel life. That's truth. You take and do what you want to with it, but that's what the truth of the matter is. And our lives and our goal here is we're all going to screw up. We're all going to watch stuff we shouldn't watch. I'm not trying to condemn you, but the idea is that as we live every day, we're seeking to be more holy and to walk in more holiness and more righteous because and more righteousness because that's the life that Christ has called us to live, is to live as his example and the life that he's called us to live, a holy life, a righteous life, so that people can come to know who he is. And if we don't make choices in our life to cut things out when the Lord's telling us, hey, cut some of this crap out of your life, then we're denying him and we're not living the gospel life he's called us to live. Y'all track with me on that? So I'm not trying to beat a dead horse, but man, you, that's just so central to what his argument is and there's so much application for us there. So going into a chapter 1, um, verse, if you've got in your Bible, if there's subtitles, verse 11 says Paul defends his ministry. He spends verses 11 through 24 defending this gospel message that he's that he's been sharing he says in here hey this gospel message that i'm sharing it's not i didn't make this up i didn't come up with it on my own i got this from christ jesus from god uh, it's direct from him it's it's christ it's jesus alone um you know he's he's just going on and on about it, and that's what he's trying to you know trying to to uh to to build to that point um and he even says in there uh uh uh, something about that, uh, you know, in verse 20, he says, uh, uh, now that now in what I'm writing to you, I assure you before God that I'm not lying. I just trying to really reiterate he, as he's writing, hey, this message that I have, it's, it's not something that's made up. Guys, and we have to be able to understand and, and build on that too for us. And our, as part of our faith is understanding and believing in this message that as Paul's writing this out and he's sharing this truth, our faith is built on what on his words in part. The, the message that he has in part is the Christianity that we're living out. Um, so to take the things that he's saying um, and really process them is a, it's a big thing. Uh, but as he walks through, that's what he's trying to build is this case saying this gospel that I have, this gospel message that I'm preaching, this gospel message that I'm presently preaching. Um, so that's chapter 1, uh, chapter, the end of chapter 1. Chapter 2 um, begins as he starts talking about that he goes to the council of Jerusalem. He's got this gospel message he's been preaching. Um, he's, he spent time off by himself even in the verses 11 through 24. He spent time by himself. He um, studied further. It's not that he didn't share the gospel some, but he uh, was you know spending time with the Lord, you know, letting the Holy Spirit speak, and speak things to him. He began to develop this, this gospel message that he went and shared. Um, verse 2 says, then he went after 14 years, uh, 14 additional years probably, uh, he went back to Jerusalem um, because of a, a revelation, um, and most likely that revelation, I don't know how much I've talked about it, but most likely that revelation is that uh, in the book of Acts we read about somebody comes and says there's a famine that's going to hit Jerusalem, so they take up an offering and take it back to Jerusalem. Um, Saul or Paul goes back then at that point, um, and, and most likely that's probably what the revelation was that he's talking about. When he goes back to uh, Jerusalem, I'm just going to kind of read chapter 2, um, and that's kind of where we're going to be at today. We're going to focus again on verses uh, 6 through 10, but I'm going to read 1 through 10 to kind of frame the context. It says, Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. Uh, something to note there is that that's a, uh, one of those, uh, Barnabas is a Jew, uh, Titus is a, a Gentile. Okay, So he takes these two people with him, his right kind of guys that he does ministry with. Um, it was because of a revelation that I went up and I submitted to them the gospel, which I preach among the Gentiles. But I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. And you need to understand, Paul's not fearful of the fact that maybe he preached the bad, a bad gospel. Uh, Paul's fearful of the fact that if he goes and they don't agree with him, it's going to cause a division in the church. Okay, he's not he's not scared that like, oh my gosh, I've been preaching this message. I sure hope that they agree with it, you know, or I'm gonna have to go tell everyone I was wrong. That's not what he's thinking. His thought is is man, if they don't agree with this, we're about to throw down. 
and it's going to cause a division in the church because he knows that the message that he's been preaching is a message that, the, that was from Christ Jesus. He's established that. The whole, we've read however many verses we've read up to verse 2 in here, so 26 verses through here, where he's saying this message is from Christ Jesus. This message is from the Lord. Um, so anyways, he, and he says those of reputation, you got to understand this too, is that the Judaizers, they were all about like, well, you know, these, all the apostles were Jews. At the, you know, all the, the, you know the, the people that he goes back to Jerusalem for, they're all Jews. Um, and so he, so he, he uses the term those of reputation, and he uses that several times, and even what we're going to look at today, he uses that term because he specifically is trying not to give these Judaizers uh, ammunition to be able to be like, oh, well, the apostles, John, the, the apostle Peter, uh, the apostle uh, James, um, they say these things. So he just uses this like kind of scaled down term to just say the people of reputation, um, which kind of like a, is a, is sort of a big thing as we kind of read through here. But just kind of keep that in your mind. Uh, but I did so in private to those who were of, of reputation, for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was Greek, was compelled to be circumcised after they got done talking. Not even Titus, who was a Gentile, uh, felt like he needed to be circumcised. But it was because of the false brethren, brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spite our liberty, which we had in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. Um, so right here in verse 4 he's saying that as, as he met kind of in private um, with those who were of reputation, that, they, that some, uh, some Judaizers had snuck in to be able to uh, try and steal the liberties that we actually have in Christ Jesus. Okay, um, so that they wanted to come in and say, "No, you have to be circumcised. No, you have to follow the law of Moses. No, you have to do all this." Um, uh, but we well, these, these are like uh, teachers that were following them around, trying to catch them, and or they were just. It might have been people that had that knew he was going to Jerusalem and might have came in there, but but most likely in order to be, I would think most likely to be. And this is my personal opinion. Most likely in order to be able to get into a meeting where James and John and Peter. And the pillars of the church were at. It probably had to be Judaizers that were in Jerusalem already um, that had heard of the message that Paul was preaching, and they came into this meeting because it wasn't there wasn't just Judaizers in uh, Jerusalem. There was Judaizers like anywhere that there was Christianity in the Jews. There was a dispersion um, early on in Christianity that caused a lot of the Jewish the Jewish Christians to be dispersed. Um, throughout all the different regions. And so there was people who believed in Christ, but because of their heritage and because of their beliefs, they adopted their traditions. And so that's, that's what we have going on in Jerusalem is that uh, there's people that were probably there, in my opinion, um, that, again, you know, they believe strongly that you, had to, you have to follow the law. So, um, but, I mean, part of that's my opinion. Um, so anyways, in verse 4, but it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spite our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. Um, and so just right there, Paul saying, hey, I, we, we, we kind of we kind of battled this out for a little bit, but he says we didn't even yield in subjection for an hour. You know, they just kind of went back and forth. What I, as I'm kind of reading this, what I'm thinking about, they kind of went back and forth talking about um, what the gospel was and who the gospel was for, um, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. The kind of important thing, guys, is that Paul went to battle for the Gentiles, that the gospel message would be accepted among the Jewish people. If it hadn't worked out like this, it might have worked out to where, uh, I mean, the Lord. God's sovereign. He knew how it was going to work out, and it worked out according to how it was. But if you think about how it could have worked out, it could have worked out where there was a Jewish Christianity and then there was a Gentile Christianity um, in two separate, very separate movements. Um, but God in his sovereignty, he, he, he was able to uh, and had this worked out when they all met together. They all came to agreement that, yes, this, uh, this gospel message is for everyone. Um, and so that's that's what he's getting at, that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. And that's a powerful thing. Uh, so verse 6, where we're going to focus at today. Everybody kind of good on that, where we're at, all, all kind of on the same page, picking up on that? Come on in. So that brings us up to uh, Galatians chapter 2, 
verses 6 through 10. Okay, so Galatians 2, 6 through 10. And it reads, But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, for he who effectually worked out Peter and his apostleship to the circumcised, effectually worked out in me to the Gentiles, and recognized the grace that had been given to me. James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was also eager to do. So, a lot to chew on there, a lot of stuff that he's talking about, okay? So, we're going to do what we do every week. We're going to kind of just walk through and just look at and ask, like, what's he saying? Why is he saying it? Want to keep in context, though, kind of what we talked about. That's why it's important to kind of look back. What's he been talking about? What's he been saying up to this point? Because it frames what he's talking about right now. So, Chapter 2, verse 6, But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. What's, what's he talking about? What's going on there? It, it wasn't from them. I yeah. didn't get the message from them. Okay. And that they totally agreed with what he was preaching. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. So their their messages were the same. Yeah. They each had a different purpose, but for the same main purpose to bring the gospel to everyone. That's right. That's good. Anything else that we see there? To me, it, it, He's trying. It seems like he's trying to tell the church in Galatia that, yeah, these guys were important, but they were no more important than you are. Yeah. And I see them that way because that's how God sees you. God sees you as just as important to Him as He sees these pillars in Jerusalem. Amen. That's and that's a great point. That's there. Uh, and like a minute ago, when we were kind of framing some of the context, and I told you guys that He uses. This idea, these people who have reputation, these people who have reputation, these people who are of reputation, who were pillars. Um, he doesn't come out and say apostles because these Judaizers that were teaching this false Christianity, uh, they would jump on this idea of like, oh, the apostles. And so he just uses this idea of these people who were of reputation. But then he goes and he kind of dives in further and he says, hey, you know, who they are makes no difference to me because God is not partial. And, and, and he kind of brings it down saying, hey, there's nothing special about these guys over me or over you. And that's kind of what Paul's driving, and that's, that's the underlying what he's getting at as he states those things, is that for these guys, we, we might look at somebody as like, oh, man, they're, they're the preacher, or they're you know, the application for us. They, they might be some high and mighty person in our eyes, but to God, there's no partiality which is something we also read in the book of James, that same idea. Uh, funny that he says that after having met with James, uh, who's the same guy who writes the book of James, Jesus' brother, um, says there's this idea of there's no partiality in, in whom there's no shifting shadows. Um, but that's an idea that's there and something that we can take and chew on. So we might look at people and really you know, lift people up high in our own eyes, um, but to God, he doesn't show favoritism like that. Um, yeah, that's one of the notes that I had written down is God has no favors, <coughs> meaning that all believers are equal. Amen. Amen. Yeah, it's, uh, it's 100% true. To, to Paul's point, Paul is using that to, to build his argument that, uh, that there was nothing you know, lofty about these guys as the Judaizers that were sitting there saying Jesus plus the law of Moses, um, that there's nothing special about them. Um, anything, anything else that we see there? One of the things that you guys mentioned just a second ago was the idea that uh, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. 
Um, Paul, as he's making this argument about this gospel message that he's going and preaching, the fact that there's only one gospel message, it's the same gospel message, and then if you add to it, you're living a non-gospel life. As he's sitting there preaching this and he's being so adamant about it, he says that, that those were who have reputation, that, that we look at as lofty and high, or that they would look at as lofty and high, that he says they added nothing to this message that I was preaching. Uh, so, that, I mean, that's a, that's a big thing to be able to take and uh, understand as Paul is going and preaching this message. And, he, he's, he's, and, and keep it in context, guys. We're, we're looking at it, a, a scenario or story of what happened. But bigger pictures, he's trying to relay back to the people in Galatia and this whole region who've taken and they've adopted this, this false life, this non-gospel life. They think they're living the gospel life, but they're really living a non-gospel life. And Paul's sitting here trying to drive home this idea of like, guys, there's only one gospel. And when you take and you add to it and, and you, you're, you're living this non-gospel life. And he's saying, I preached to you all the gospel. I even went to these guys over here and I told them this is what I'm preaching. And they didn't add anything to it. But y'all have taken and added stuff to it. That's what Paul's getting at. And this the whole thing that he started off in verse 6. As soon as he gets done saying this message I have from Christ Jesus is not from man. or not, It's from the Lord. It's not from man. And he goes on and he just starts blowing up on the fact that there's only one gospel. He's really agitated about it. He's trying to really drive home. And then here again, the same idea. I mean, I know I'm reiterating as I'm talking to y'all, but that's what Paul's doing as he's writing. That's the same thing over and over and over and over. There's only one gospel message, period. If you take and you add to the gospel message, you are fooling yourself. You're spinning your wheels. You're wasting your time. There's only one gospel message. Did he hear this, that, you know, they were adding to things? Did he hear this while he was there, or did he get a letter from somebody saying, hey, you need to come here? He pro- I, I'm this, I have no idea. He probably, my guess is, he probably got word from people that he was kept in association with. It's probably, my guess, somebody from one of those churches and one in that region somewhere. He you probably got here, word, right? yeah, saying, hey, this is this is going on. We're hearing this. This is, this is, we're seeing this, this type of stuff's going on. But it was prevalent. Even when he goes to Jerusalem, like we talked about a minute ago, he goes to Jerusalem. There's some Judaizers in there that as soon as Paul starts saying, this God, this is the gospel message that the Lord's given me for the Gentiles, um, immediately people start saying, no, you have to be circumcised. No, you have to follow the law of Moses. So it was probably a prevalent thing that was kind of all over the place, but he specifically heard it was going on there, and so that's why he's writing this letter to these churches in Galatia. Um, I just wanted to say again, though, that even as, as he's writing here and he says that, that, that he shared this message of the gospel that he took to the Gentiles, he shares it with the council in Jerusalem or to this special secret meeting in Jerusalem. And these people who have reputation added nothing. And it goes back to the point immediately that we look back in verse 6 that, and just like what I was saying when I started the class this morning, it's the idea that if we take and we add anything to the gospel, that we're fooling ourselves and we're living a non-gospel life. Guys, I mean, I just, I can't, uh, reiterate that enough for me how much I believe that to be present and prevalent in the church today is that we take and we think that we're doing and living this great Christian life we're all about the Lord Jesus but the reality is is that we're taking and we're living and we're applying the life that we want to live over on top of that and we're in the, the reality what Paul is getting at here is that there's only one gospel and if you're taking and you're trying to live out and apply uh, something else on top of, you're just fooling yourself. Um, on that note, a word that the Lord has like put in my path lately is the word reputation. So the fact that it's in here, I don't know if it's just for me or if I'm supposed to share it, but your reputation is what everyone thinks they know about you. But it doesn't mean that you actually, that's your character. So your character is between you and the Lord. And so these men are of high reputation because that's what everybody believes they know about them. But just like you're saying, even the pastor might have some struggles that we need to pray over without knowing what they are. Just pray for him and be praying for everybody else in our lives. Just because reputation doesn't necessarily mean that the character lines up with it. Amen. Amen. That's really good. And, and, and to that point, some of the people who were in that meeting 
as he says, these people who were who came in, who were spies, trying to spy out our liberties. There was people who were in there who who were thought to be true Christian believers, but that wasn't the case. What they really believed was that you had to adopt the law of Moses. So I mean, it's the same thing. Is that they had a, a fallacy to them, um, exactly like what you're talking about. So, and it became evident as they started trying to hash out, you know, what's up with this gospel message. Uh, verse 7 says, But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, and then verse 8 says, For he who effectually worked out, worked for Peter and his apostleship to the circumcised, effectually worked out for me also to the Gentiles. So just kind of verses 7 and 8, just want to throw that out. What are some things you guys see there in those verses? Well, in my Bible, it reads a little bit different. Okay. Uh, it says, uh, starting with seven, it says, Instead they saw God had given me the responsibility of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as he had given Peter the responsibility of preaching to the Jews. Verse 8, for, saying, for the same God who worked through Peter as the apostle to the Jews also worked through me as the apostle to the Gentiles. Okay. <clears throat> So what, what he's saying is that uh, he, he's on the same level as Peter uh, as he's out preaching to the Gentiles just as Peter did to the Jews. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Anybody else see anything there? In mine, it's got in the notes again that Paul's not saying there's a separate message for the Jews as, and then one for the Gentiles it's the same message it's just he was appointed by God to go to the Gentiles Peter was appointed to go to the Jews they're both preaching the same gospel mm-hmm. there's no difference it's just one's going to one group the other's going to the other group mm-hmm. Amen. because God felt that they would be more effective that way Amen that's right. Uh, and just to that point, I mean, that's, that's definitely something that we're seeing there in the text. And that, that for me, as I'm sitting there reading and I'm sitting there thinking about, okay, he went to these people, he went to these people. It's just like me. If I, if I want to go to the mall and I'm, I'm going to stop and talk to some teenagers and I want to try and share the gospel with them, uh, which, I mean, I love for me. It's, it's been a minute, but I love going to the mall. I love finding a big group of young uh, gangster guys. And I love just to jump in front of them, and I like to just stop them right in their tracks. This this, this old guy's just jumping in front of them, and I'm like, hey, I need to ask you guys a question real quick. Well, I know how to share the gospel with that group of people. I know what to be able to say to them. I know how to be able to, to, to share the gospel and meet them where they're at. And for Paul and Peter, Peter's going to the, circ- to the circumcised, to the Jew. And he's sharing the gospel based on the Jewish heritage, based on um, what he needs to be able to share to be able to effectively minister, for them to be able to effectively receive and hear the gospel. And for Paul, his message is to the Gentiles. He's going and sharing the, the, the grace of God uh, to the Gentiles, to the uncircumcised. To me, it's the same type of idea of like that, you know, you, if you're going to share the gospel with somebody who's hurting, somebody who's uh, at this stage in life, somebody who's, who's here, it's the same type of idea that, that I'm going to meet somebody where they're at um, and with what's going on with them so that I'm able to share the gospel. It's not that they were sharing different gospels. It's the same gospel. They're just sharing the parts and, and the, what was needed to be able to share uh, to be shared so that they are able to receive the truth of the gospel. You you don't go to uh, to a Jew and share the gospel with them the same way that you would uh, somebody who's from North America. Um, there's different things going on with them, culture, uh, things like that, and that's it, to an extent, you know, kind of as I'm sitting here thinking and processing and was processing uh, that there's this idea of the uncircumcised and circumcised. It's the same gospel message, um, but the different ways that it's shared. Different so. presentation. Your testimony, like you wouldn't be able to witness with the same understanding to certain people that I can, and I can't the same as you. I mean, hundred percent, yeah. That's correct. That's, that's true. 
Well, I'll give you an example. As most of you know, I'm an instructor. I teach air conditioning. But the first day of my class, I ask all the people, well, all the guys or ladies in there, what their hobbies are. And the reason I want to know what their hobbies are is by knowing what their hobbies are, it gives me a way to express in their language what they understand. Mm -hmm. If they have a problem understanding something I'm saying, if I know what their hobbies or their interest is, I can relate to them through that. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Well, um, Palmer's presenting the gospel in the way of you've been told, you've been doing this all your life. Jesus came and did this, and now you need to do it this way. What you were doing was good. It's not necessary anymore to get you to heaven. Mm -hmm. And Paul, or yeah, Paul, when he was going out, he didn't have to say all that stuff. Mm -hmm. He just said, "It said Jesus came, and this is what he did, and this is what what you need to do." Amen. Amen. No. Anything else there? <coughs> Uh, verse 9 says, And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So what are some things we see there in verse 9? Peter and John was, had the reputation uh, to be pillars, to be something strong to stand on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To me, it tells me that they received or acknowledged the gift that God had given to Paul mm -hmm. of being able to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, so uh, on that point, we see it says they extended the right hand of Christian fellowship. They shook hands on it. They sealed the deal. Um, so they, they met. They came to a conclusion. Decided that, yeah, this message that Paul's preaching, it is the gospel message. And it is the gospel message. And the Gentiles are a part of that gospel message. So they shook hands on it. They, sh they extended the right hand of Christian fellowship. And they shook hands. They sealed the deal. Um, and that's, that was what was supposed to happen going forward. So that's exactly what's going on there. That's a good, good point. Uh, anything else? Because, I mean, going back in the context, he's writing this letter to the churches of Galatia where the Judaizers have been infiltrating and preaching a false gospel. To me, it, it's saying, all right, here are the guys that the Judaizers are saying, they're the ones of, they're the pillars. They agree that I am the one, that my message is the one that you need to hear in Galatia, that the Gentiles need to hear I'm the one you need to be listening to, not these false prophets or false teachers. Mm -hmm. My message is the same that they're teaching. It's just real. The pillars mm -hmm. have said, I'm the one to come to you. That God, They agree that God has ordained me to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. <coughs> what I'm saying is God's message and only God's message. Amen. Amen. So we take that thought, guys... And not to beat a dead horse, but you take that that thought where he says, look, I met with them. They said it's all really good. We shook hands on it. We sealed the deal that this message that I'm preaching, it is the gospel <coughs> message. Then you take that and you put that back into the beginning of Galatians when he's sitting there going off on this on the these churches in Galatia saying, look, guys, y'all are taking an ad into the gospel, which, which makes it not the gospel because there's only one gospel. Um... Uh, that, that that means that there's a lot of application for us as he re, re, relives this scenario to the Galatians to prove his apostleship and to prove this gospel message to defend his ministry as he takes and he, we, we read through this what we would just read through like oh it's just a quick story um, we're walking through a verse at a time because we want to we want to just really grab and see what's really there for us. What we really want to grab and see what's there for us as we process through and we see we should read through this and be like, oh man, he met with them and they said that what he's preaching is the truth. 
and that there's only one gospel and the Gentiles are for it and that they all, the pillars of the church at the time, they all agreed and they all uh, uh, you know, s- supported what he was and they shook hands on it. And so as we go back and we look at Galatians and this, this message that he starts off and what Paul's so bothered about is the fact that these people aren't living out the gospel life. They're taking an add to it. And as we talked about before, what they're adding to it is is uh, is like a, a righteousness, a zealousness. They're adding the idea that okay, well, if I'm really going to follow Jesus, I'm going to be circumcised. I'm I'm going to follow the law of Moses. And Paul's been out of shape about that. Now, I can't believe y'all would you know add to the gospel the fact of being circumcised and the the fact of uh, having to follow the law of Moses. I'm going to ask you, what would Paul say to us today when the things we add to the gospel is the life that we want to live? Because that's what we add to the gospel today. The, we add to the gospel today, like I said earlier, the movies we want to watch. We, we feel like the Lord's telling us, hey, you know, stay away from this trash today. But we say, ah, it's, it's not super trashy. It's I mean, okay if I say the little cuts word. It's okay if I do it, yeah. I'll be honest, man. Like, y'all know I've been going and playing basketball. I've going, been going to the gym playing basketball. And, like, the other day, like, I'm sitting there playing basketball, and I get so frustrated. I was like, grab it. You know, and I just start, you know, kind of, you know, so I'm like, I, you know, I said, damn it. And then uh, I'm playing basketball again, and something else happens. And so I let it come out again, and I play basketball a little bit longer, and I get frustrated, and something else comes out. And I get done playing basketball, we're driving back in the truck, and Gavin says, you know, Today, when you're playing basketball, you started acting like a different person. I don't know what you're talking about. I never do that just because I said a bad word or two or five or Ten. got angry. <laughs> you know, it's because I almost knocked somebody out, you know. But like what he told me is true. I'm sitting there playing, justifying and not holding my tongue and that's little and you might look at it you know you might sit here and tell you know say oh that's just little that's nothing but for me it's huge especially my son tells me hey I noticed today when you were playing that you're acting like a different person and not in a good way Um, and that goes back to what Paul's talking about is that there's only one gospel and we have to live out that gospel life we have to make choices in our life to choose to live out the gospel, even in the, even in the middle of playing basketball, even in the middle of what's going on in our homes and our families. We have to make those choices to live out what the gospel is. And if we're not doing it, guys, if, if I, can, I can argue with Gavin about my actions when I'm playing basketball, in fact, I did for a minute, to try and justify and reason and rationalize why it was okay that I acted how I acted. But the truth is, is that I'm only reasoning and rationalizing and justifying in my life, my mind, the life that I'm living to make it be okay with the gospel life that I think I'm living. The reality and the truth is, is that someone confronted me with something that was not the gospel life, and I tried to justify why it was the gospel life. And that's the truth, and you can take and you can do what you want to with that over a silly little thing at basketball. But the truth for us, as we look at what Paul's talking about, is that there's only one. And we're called to live out that one gospel life. And if you don't do it, you're only fooling yourself. So, anyways, wrap up in verse 10. Uh, it's kind of a different little thought as he, as he says, the only thing asked us, uh, the, uh, they only asked us to remember the, uh, sorry, verse 10, they only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was also eager to do. Uh, any thoughts there? Anything else there as we wrap up for today? almost as if he's reiterating they didn't ask me to change the message that's right yeah they didn't ask me to change anything everything I was saying was on point the only thing they said was hey just make sure you remember the point they remember the poor he says that's the very thing I was eager to do because we read in verse 1 or 2 I think it's verse 2 he says that uh, because of a prophecy he uh, or a revelation rather uh, that he says uh, we made this we, we're here because of a revelation which we which I mentioned he always from Acts uh, that, that a prophet comes and says there's going to be a famine in Jerusalem so they take up an offering and they come to Jerusalem with the offering 
So he says, I'm, I, you know, I'm eager to do that, but we're going to make sure we keep doing it. But that's the only thing that they had to do. That, you know, the only thing they instructed me was to keep uh, having a concern for the poor. So but anything else? Because the, the poor at that time, they had to go to the temples and pay so much. The poor didn't necessarily get to hear the gospel at all. Mm-hmm. Because if they had, they sometimes would go and they'd have to pay whatever price just to get another form of money to be able to barter within the temple to be able to have what they thought their sin would be forgiven. Amen. And so if they didn't have enough of that money that then could be transferred within the temple, they couldn't even enter in. And sometimes once they did, they still didn't have enough because of the money wasn't the same amount. Mm-hmm. So a lot of poor didn't even get to go, which meant they heard nothing. Amen. And a lot of them couldn't read or write very well. So if they didn't have people coming to them, they wouldn't hear it. Amen. Amen. That's great truth. And even taking that idea, when you look back into the Old Testament, that was one of the things that was the most dear to the Lord's heart, to God's heart, was the poor. Um, the, even whenever they cleared out a field, they weren't supposed to clean the edges of a field. They were supposed to leave that for the poor um, and the widows to be able to have food. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of heart there for God and for the Lord um, for the poor. But that's a great point that's for the poor to be able to get to even when you're hear the gospel. Make sure you drop some. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not just that you did it pick up what you dropped, but if you didn't drop enough, then drop mm-hmm. some drop some mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's good. That's really good. Good thoughts. Anything else? So here's one. There's a different twist on this. Okay. So it, it sounds like maybe some of the Judaizers thought they were doing a good thing because some of the things they were telling you to do, following the law of Moses, can be a good thing. Can you be. can direct your interactions with God and other people and the people that are supposed to be your leaders and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't have to be that way. So even today, there are people that say, oh, you have to do church a certain way. you got to be here on Sunday night. you got to be here on Wednesday. you got to do this. you got to do that. To be a real church, you have to mm-hmm. do this. But nowhere in here does it say you have to do that. Mm-hmm. It says you have to get together on a regular basis. It says when two or more are gathered, he's there. But it doesn't say it has to be Sunday morning at 11, Sunday evening at 6, Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and you got to do VBS every... But those are things that we have. There are good things to gather, but they're not necessarily... You've got to do this to be a good church. Mm-hmm. And so we have to be on the guard when people say, oh, you don't sing hymns? Oh, I can't go to the church. Oh, you don't do it on Sunday night? Oh, that, that's, a, that's not a real church. Mm-hmm. We just have to be real careful about do we have to get together? Absolutely. It says here we have to get together. It doesn't say when, it doesn't say where, it doesn't say how. We be really careful that we put things on ourselves that are not I mean, it's going to get, take some use to it. It's going to take some getting used to it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> the law of Moses is what, you, is what is, it used to be what you had to do. But now it's what you should do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of people that say you don't have to go to church, church, and then the people there are saying that you don't have to go to church are really the ones that are not in or even the word. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, next week we will uh, all really good thoughts. Uh, next week we'll jump into the next verse and start to look at uh, conflict with Peter and Paul. Uh, just kind of chew on that a little bit and continue to walk through. I'm going to take, so now we got this board up here, I'm going to take and I'll, I'm going to kind of reiterate and put some of the main points of context so that as we're going through the letter, we got some things we can kind of be able to look back at as we want to make sure as we're reading through that we're framing the context always of what's being talked about and looking at the bigger picture of, of what, what's being communicated. It's like we, we're always trying to do, but... Um, I'm going to close in prayer, and then uh, we'll go out there for church. So, Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for just the opportunity to be able to gather uh, again with the church family, with our church family, uh, be able to look at the truth of your word. Uh, Father, we just pray that you would um, just help us to really be able to process and reconcile the truth of what we read with the life that we're living. Um, as we look at Paul and he, his, his uh, account of meeting with these church leaders in Jerusalem, um, we see the truth that, um, that he was preaching the true gospel message and and just bigger picture for us that means there is only one gospel message and that if we're not living that out we're fooling ourselves so God I just pray that you help us just to process the life that we're living God help us to be honest with ourselves Um, specifically Lord just help me be honest with myself as I you know just share about playing basketball and just seeing things like that in my life 
Um, God, I, I want to live a life that honors you. And, and Father, I know that everyone in here feels the same for themselves. So, Father, we just ask you, you would just make things evident for us. Um, Father, just uh, minister to us with this truth. Um, Father, encourage us and help us to walk in your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.